So my name is uh, uh, Harold Ruth. Um, for the last 12 years, I've been doing research at the Fraunhofer IGD in Germany, uh, which is a, a mostly government-funded applied research institute uh, having to do with uh, any visual computing problems. I was then the Department of uh, Augmented and Virtual Reality. And what I was doing is uh, creating like any kind of uh, tracking algorithms for augmented reality applications. So we did lots of uh, marketing, uh, cultural heritage applications, but like our main focus was always uh, industrial applications. And that's uh, also like the topic of, of my talk. And uh, we did lots of uh, projects at the Fraunhofer, but like this were all proof of concepts uh, and demonstrators and prototypes, but we never sold real products. And that's why we now try to uh, spin out of our Fraunhofer department and create a startup, a startup company uh, called VisionLib, where we want to uh, productize like uh, a tracking SDK. So, um, uh, what do we need to enable augmented reality? Of course, we have like uh, a device, a smartphone, tablet, glasses, or projectors. We need some uh, 3D content data, uh, a rendering like the 3D graphics, and a correct uh, superimposition of these uh, 3D graphics. And in order to do so, uh, we need like a correct alignment, like a localization of the device, and the uh, which is like the transformation between like the, the device uh, in the real real world coordinate system. So to solve uh, these uh, tracking problems, so the localization and orientation uh, of a certain device in the real world, uh, we've been doing lots of research in uh, different kinds of tracking methods. So this was like uh, 12 years ago where, where we used like uh, squared markers with a binary pattern code. So this were like the beginnings in like 2000 around there were these, uh, there was like our toolkit, like the most popular uh, tracking SDK where everybody was using markers. But of course in, in industry use cases, people said, okay, this is working, but like, of course, we don't want to need to place markers because uh, uh, especially like in, in uh, design of the nice cars, they want to have like some nice looking uh, parts and so, the markers were not like a, a nice option. So the next step in the, the evolution was like using reference images. This uh, works pretty well like for, there have been lots of applications like for marketing and uh, also so, uh, sales where people use like magazines to uh, augment any, any virtual content. So this technically works well and people said, okay, we did that markerless. We don't have any markers anymore because it's just all natural feature based. But at the end, when you just take the, the reference image, it always, it's, it serves like the same way as a marker. So it's not really markerless because uh, the reference image can also be regarded as a marker. Uh, then there, there are these slam based uh, structure for motion reconstruction ideas. Uh, like this was uh, 2009 at the uh, ISMA uh, tracking contest. Like the ISMA is the uh, main conference for like scientific uh, research for augmented reality and they uh, carried out these tracking contests where they gave us some certain uh, reference uh, coordinates in the world. These are like the red crosses and the object was to find like the, the yellow, like some, some certain point. So it's like more like an indoor navigation system to find some certain uh, points or spots like in the real world. For example here like the, the uh, object was just to pick the right book from the shelf with a given 3D position in space. So here this was like a, a slam based system where we created like a feature map, used this feature map, uh, put, uh, put it in a real, in the, in the coordinate system of the given reference coordinates, and then uh, used this like as a, as a tracking uh, reference data. And yeah, this were like the, the early stages of, of all these slam based tracking and they made like some challenges of blinking Christmas trees. Of course, this makes uh, stuff quite hard because feature based uh, methods are always very light dependent and if there's like lots of lighting change, this make, makes uh, yeah, the tracking robustness quite unstable. So then uh, a couple of years ago, there have been like uh, direct methods for tracking. So the difference is that there are no features anymore because like features for feature based tracking there always needs to be like a well structured uh, scenario a nicely textured 
uh, objects, but for like these direct methods, for the direct methods, uh, Zemi dense uh, tracking and mapping can carry it out. So this works also much better for uh, sceneries which are not textured that well, especially this is like the use case in any industrial environment. We have like uh, RGBD SLAM, like starting with the Kinect Fusion, where we did like uh, death based camera tracking, which is also a very good option if we have like the, the CAT model, which can be also aligned in the in the depth image to, to estimate the, the camera position and, and orientation to uh, add some virtual contact exactly at that uh, position in the real world. So then uh, we did like uh, lots of model-based uh, tracking. So this, this was actually the first thing I started uh, when I went there, but like many years, nobody was really interested in these model-based uh, tracking technologies. But during the last years, there was more and more interest and people realized, okay, if, if you have the model and they could just use this CAT model as a tracking reference, things would be uh, so much more easy. And here, this is like, uh, this was also like at a, a tracking challenge from Volkswagen where we got like a, a CAT model as a reference and the, uh, the task was to just find this, this CAT model in the, in the real image. So, yeah, these were just some, some simple re uh, results we got there and there was a robot who was moving uh, the, a, a, a steering wheel and we got the 3D model of the steering wheel and could, could apply like our uh, tracking algorithm with this data. And there was uh, like another scenario which we'll see like uh, in a couple of seconds where we got like a frame of, uh, of some, some car and this was pretty much the same uh, same task, just from some, from some given uh, geometry model, uh, which which we see here. This is like the input which we used like for for our tracking method, and uh, you used this like as, as uh, only reference for like the tracking. So here we see like also like the green lines are like the just to validate like the lines which are used here for tracking that the correct that we see like okay we have like a correct alignment and also here we got like. The, the task of finding some certain points which are at uh, a, a given locations. And we had to point out these uh, points and then uh, we, uh, the, these results were measured with some uh, measuring tool. And yeah, we were like uh, 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 quite lucky in this challenge and, and were able to like win these, uh, uh, these scenarios with our, our tracking system. Then of course there are like uh, sensor-based uh, methods like inertial sensor, uh, GPS, or mechanical tracking, which can also be quite useful in, in some certain scenarios. Uh, beacons for like a rough localization. And uh, another thing is like uh, the fusion of the several kinds of tracking methods. Like here we have like a camera-based, sensor-based tracking methods. One example is here the, the fusion of uh, some visual and inertial uh, tracking method. Uh, a very, uh, like a benefit of these methods is that the vision can be reduced to a very limited amount. So all, all the, on the left side you see like uh, feature points, but in actually only the green feature points are used for like image processing. And like the other points are only uh, like uh, projected into the image. And uh, so the, the sensor is actually doing most of the work and only a very few features are needed to keep, keep the whole sensor on track. So the, the amount of computing time can be limited by these uh, fusion approaches a lot because uh, yeah, computing power is limited on mobile devices and so this makes uh, things much easier. So for industrial AR, uh, to enable those applications, uh, we have some requirements. Of course, it needs to be mobile because like uh, augmented reality is like a technology designed for humans and humans, uh, need to be mobile when especially when they need to do some maintenance and repair scenario there's some some uh, static augmented, augmented reality scenarios but of course most of the use cases people have to walk around and do some inspections has to handle partial uh, occlusions robust against scene changes when like there is some assembly disassembly uh, parts illumination changes bad lighting conditions are always like a a uh, hard task we've been uh, facing. 
it needs to be applicable with different objects which are just identical in construction. So if I have like a green car and the red car, it should similarly work uh, in the same way. And like one quite important uh, fact is that it needs to be really easy to set up and, and to deploy because we want to help people to make their life easier so that uh, they get their stuff done faster. So if it's just too complicated, uh, nobody wants to use augmented reality. So it must be just easy to, to set up and to deploy. So if you just look at these uh, different tracking technologies, uh, we can say, okay, markers, they, they are like, they can be like a, a good choice. Like imagine if like, uh, if there is a long hallway of like switchboards and all look the same, uh, there's no chance of having any visual recognition because when, if everything looks the same, you need some other, other technique to, to detect like a certain device ID. So markers, QR codes like are a, a, a usable choice. Reference images are kind of useless because if you, if you want to print out a poster and hanging on some industrial scenario, just use a marker because there could be, this is just easy, Can you could get more information into the marker, it could get smaller, so reference images are more useful for like magazines and marketing. The slam based methods uh, can be used, uh, they, they are useful for like instant tracking but we always have the problem that we have to define some coordinate system. This, this of course can be done, but this is like a, a pre-processing step which, which needs to be done, done in advance. This uh, can be possible, but this makes uh, the, scalable, the scalability of such systems uh, quite hard. And also like the same thing for the, the dev-based SLAM uh, methods. So what I what, uh, really think is that the model-based tracking uh, methods are like a very good choice for, for industrial applications because like CAT models, they always exist and so it's, uh, it's just a waste not to use them and just try to go an extra loop around uh, creating some uh, yeah, feature maps and uh, because yeah, just use the models, models directly, this is a very direct and easy way. Like inertial sensors, GPS is yeah, more like for outdoor but like not for, the, for, for industrial use cases. Many people use mechanical tracking. This can be useful for very precise, uh, for, for like problems where you need to be very precise. Like there's like the furrow arm, which furrow arm, where you can do like precise mechanical tracking where we don't rely on any uh, optical images. And yet uh, beacons, Bluetooth uh, can be also useful for like localization, for like a rough localization, a big factory hall. And of course, like uh, fusion is, always like as many if you if you just make mix many methods it makes things much easier because like there's no method which really solves like every problem but like by fusing many uh, methods really have the potential to make uh, things much stable so here this is like another um, example where we just used a similar in a, in a very uh, similar scenario where we had like a, a car and on the left side we see like a, a feature map which was reconstructed and we used these feature map to solve like one, one of these uh, uh, tracking contest problems. Um, this works out if we have like the car in this position uh, with, a, with exactly these lighting uh, conditions. But uh, if we move the car outside or put it in a garage or somewhere else or change or switch off the light, then these feature based methods uh, uh, have it very hard because uh, they strongly depend on, on uh, different lighting conditions. Uh, on the on the other side, we have like the same, or like a similar uh, scenario with these uh, model-based or like model edge-based tracking methods. And here, it's uh, much easier to deploy the same application to a very different spot because these edge-based edge-based methods do not depend on any uh, lighting uh, conditions because most of them only rely like on, on image gradients. So this is uh, much more robust against uh, uh, lighting changes. So here's like a short overview of the, the benefits of the model-based tracking. It's much easier uh, to set up and uh, to deploy because all you need is just uh, get the CAT model. There's no time-consuming pre-processing step or map building learning uh, coordinate system alignment which makes things uh, 
uh, much easier to apply. The tracking configurations can be created without having seen the real model. So some tracking author can just sit somewhere in the office and if there is like a, a set of, of uh, 100 cars or machines, he can just like apply the whole tracking setup virtually from uh, on, the, on the data of the virtual models. Uh, changing in the construction, they don't cause a high adaption of costs because all, all you need is just to, to change the the reference model and then you're all set for, for, for your tracker and you don't need to re relearn an, an another map or some some extra map. And uh, another advantage is oh, they, they, these methods only depend like on the geometry and not on the material properties. So if you have like a bl uh, blue car or like a yellow car or a black car, it, it's just, it doesn't matter because uh, material properties are not like uh, uh, set in the reference data and it it's only relies on the, on the geometry data. And uh, robust against different lighting conditions and, uh, and lighting changes this is also like a, a benefit because if you're like outside on the parking lot or inside in the garage, uh, it's not a, a big difference for these uh, kind of tracking methods. And very big advantage, it's, it's very scalable with a variety of models. So if you have like a couple of hundred of models, and but a very similar application, you can always just take take the data and create a, like a kind of automated process to deploy these uh, applications. And especially for industrial use cases, this is like a big difference. If you just do like a demonstrator, uh, this works fine like for a trade show, but like if you really want to deploy uh, uh, some application, uh, some industrial application with like a big set of models, this makes it really easy to, to scale your, uh, your application. So what you need to do is just uh, take the cut model and uh, put, uh, put it in like uh, our VisionLib SDK. So this SDK uh, just uses like the model and like some, some initial rough position uh, as input and gets like access on the camera and then uh, provides like some uh, position and orientation of the model or or the camera uh, relative to the object. And these, uh, this is like a, a plugin which can be deployed on any kind of devices. Currently we so, uh, support like iOS, Android and, and Windows. Um, here's a small uh, feature list of our, our SDK. So one main feature like like we had like from at the Fraunhofer we had like a big pile of, of tracking algorithms because we did like lo lots of research. Uh, but like for the SDK we just uh, decided to pick like the most relevant parts into the SDK because those, these were the features like our, our customers were demanding uh, most. So and these features are like the, monoc the monocular model based tracking with like any polygonal 3D data. We also support, support like uh, line model based tracking with uh, uh, Metaio line models. And we also have like a, a simple, very simple reference image based tracking where you can just like stick in the any JPEG or PN, PNG file and use this as reference. On top of it like an extendable feature tracking which only works like on top of the reference image or the, the cut model based tracking. Some camera calibration uh, features and yeah, as I mentioned on, on iOS, macOS, Android and Windows. These are our uh, platforms we currently support. So we have like the, the core in the middle, uh, a C API around it, and on top of that we, we have like a Unity plugin, uh, an iOS Objective-C interface, and also like a, a Windows interface. So mostly what people do now is using uh, the, the Windows, uh, the Unity plugin, because it's just like so easy to deploy for any kind of platform. Here's some applications we have done lately. Uh, here this is some uh, some machine which is going, to, which is uh, measuring some uh, liquids. So this is like a short description of of how to use uh, uh, this machine. So for for setting up the tracking here, this is like a very like very trivial geometry, just like a black box. So but uh, as using the reference data for this box, it's, it's it's quite easy to set up an application where you need like. Some, uh, some tracking solution for these kinds of uh, yeah, short manuals. Uh, another thing we did is here for, for a car manufacturer where we just uh, used like some maintenance and repair um, 
application. So in the first step, we scan like the idea and get the ID and get like uh, the information of this certain certain uh, model on the device. And here, this is like a, a web-based HTML uh, application layer where all the content and the 3D rendering is based on HTML, HTML and uh, a JavaScript interface is used to, to access the, the vision, computer vision engine. And yeah, this was also like a demonstrating uh, application for showing a typical maintenance and repair applications uh, for yeah, like the uh, uh, augmented reality technology which is used. So, um, what, uh, well, like the lessons learned from like uh, the all all the projects uh, we've done there with any proof of concepts and prototypes, uh, feature map, they really depend a lot on lighting conditions and they are only temporary useful for like uh, environment if the environment does not change. So if you have like museums or any any indoor uh, scenarios where where things are stable, uh, feature maps can be a very good choice to to deploy your uh, your augmented reality application. But like for industrial use cases, there are always so many so many changes and. Uh, so it's kind of uh, hard to keep the process running that it's really a benefit for for some guy who needs to do some repair. So um, the creation of feature maps, it's quite a uh, time-consuming process. So it, it works out well, but like uh, it's just like uh, too much effort for applying, really deploying a maintenance and repair applications for a huge set of, of machines. Uh, SLAM, like or extensible tracking or tracking and mapping approaches, like the HoloLens is doing it, or like the Google Tango tablet, they're very beneficial. Like uh, on top of any reference-based image method. So if you have like, because it's the problem is always you need to stick some some reference in the real world uh, that you have like the correct coordinate system where you want to place your virtual uh, 3D content. So SLAM is always a good uh, choice, but like uh, these just only rely on the features is, is kind of hard because it's hard to transport this feature map to, to other places. And yeah, like cut models, uh, they always exist like in the industry. Like a couple of years ago, people always say, oh no, cut model checking is not such a good option because you need a cut model. But this is not really a pain because, because cut models are there and it would be a waste just like uh, not to use them. Uh, and yeah, so this is uh, what I think uh, are the most relevant points. So um, here we have a, a small uh, a video where we applied like our cut model based tracking uh, on the HoloLens. So this is like a very early stage where we uh, just like superimposed like the model which is used for tracking in the in the HoloLens. So. Uh, this is like um, not ready yet, so it's on a, a yeah early stage. But this is also what we want to do. That like uh, systems like the Hololens or the, the Google Tango tablets, which provide like some some slam based solutions, we just stick like our model based tracking underneath, so that people can just uh, also work with those model based tracking <coughs> techniques in their uh, Hololens applications, for example. So yes. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, you can write me a mail or uh, ask me directly. So we have uh, questions from the audience right here for you to address, starting at the top. <coughs> you start with a line that you have to match. Can you reorient scale split? Yes, please. Uh, yes. Is it possible to uh, use only a part of the line drawing or rescale it? Sometimes you have the big machine in front of you uh -huh. and you don't have the place to, to match the line drawing. Can you choose how the line drawing is to match with your real machine? Yeah, like the, 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 the 
the reference model that can be very big, like the line model, which like the process we how we use it is just like creating from from a very certain view what is going to be expected. Just take like a, a certain uh, part of this line model. So it, it can be just like a part. You don't need to see like the whole model. It can just be like a, a certain uh, a certain a part of it. Yeah, like the, the, it's, there's no no preprocessing, so you just stick in the complete model, and uh, the whole generation of lines always happening on the device itself. So it can be it can be a huge model, and like during during the checking, uh, like inside the checking uh, system, there's always like just selected the, the certain part which you really see. So it's just like a keyframe based method to generate the reference data of the of the whole scenery. Okay, let's look at the next question. Can you track within a model, such uh, as inside an aircraft? Uh, yes, it, it, like the, 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 the tracking the, it always works well if, if the reference model works well, or like it's very simil similar to the real object. So it works inside, like we tried it inside a, a car cabin. Uh, it should also work inside the, inside the aircraft, but like, these model, models always work well if you have like reference data which really kind of match like the real world. So that's like the only restriction. Can you fit when small modifications were made to the actual machine? For um, example, non hundred percent matching with reference catalog. Yes, model. like there's there's we don't need to have like a hundred percent matching. There can be some occlusion uh and uh, some changes. So what we do is just having a quality uh, threshold, uh, which we uh, take out. So, so the application developer just can decide how big the quality threshold can be. And like, if you want it really precise, you set it high, and you say, okay, there, may, there might be some small misalignments, and you can just set it a bit lower. Can model-based tracking setup be done at runtime with a user-provided CAD model on the user device? Which CAD formats are supported? Um, it's possible, yes. Like there's, uh, you can just instantly uh, take the CAD model during uh, the runtime of the application. We also created applications like this where like, people wanted to do some quality inspections with uh, some given CAD model. Uh, so yes, this is possible. and. Um, like we provide like any, we can support any kind of polygonal uh, models which consist of triangles. So it can be like a PLY or OBJ, FBX, or like any, any polygonal model. And uh, I think we have time for one more. Have you done multiple part tracking in a scenario where they might be removed or repositioned by the user while the app is running? Um, like what, what we've done is if there's some, some assembly, disassembly uh, tasks that the reference data is just virtually disassembled just the same way as the, the instruction steps are like on, on, the, on, the, on the content side. So if there's some, some disassembly, uh, you can just um, configure your tracking system in the same way that you just like disassemble it like on the same way like you want to do it to the, to the real object. So this is, this is possible. Um, we we also can do like multiple part tracking if you have, if we have like we don't have this in the SDK yet, but uh, it's like on the roadmap that we just not only use one part, but it can be like can, that there can be several parts or like also like a parametric part of some certain uh, certain object. Let's go ahead and knock off that last question. How does it scale when tracking 25, 50, or 100 parts at once? Um, well, just all at once is, is kind of difficult because the, the tracking is kind of stable if you have like if you have like some certain amount of uh, the object in the image and like if you have like hundred of small screws this won't be stable anymore. So uh, I guess uh, on the yeah I think. It, it, there, are, there are limits. Like, uh, I guess it could be working out if they're like five to ten parts, but then of course it needs lots of computing power to, to like. I think on, on a mobile device, like tracking hundred parts at once is like kind of difficult. But what we do is like also using for like static scenarios, uh, a multi-view camera setup with several 
uh, high computing machines, so this is possible to scale like just with, like, with multi-camera setups and multi-computer multi, uh, systems. All right, excellent questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you.